Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video on adding depth to DSPy programs. We're going to be exploring what it means to add depth to an LLM program, similarly to how you add layers to neural networks in PyTorch. We're going to be breaking up tasks into subtasks, and each subtask is considered as a layer in our DSPy program. We're going to be exploring this through the lens of three layer retrieval augmented generation systems that are evaluated by three layer LLM metrics, and then we're also going to look at a four layer question to blog post writer. This video is gonna have all sorts of things uh, explaining the background of adding depth to DSPy programs, as well as a deeper look into multi-model systems, building systems composed of say GPT-4, GPT Turbo, as well as say Mistral hosted with Olama and all these kind of things. And also we'll take a deep look into how the Bootstrap FewShot compiler works in DSPy. Thank you so much for watching this video. Let's dive in. Here's a quick overview of the chapters covered in this video in case you want to skip ahead to what interests you the most. We're going to kick things off by looking at some DSPy news and then we're going to transition into the big topic of this video, adding depth to DSPy programs. Depth and the analogs of layers in LLM programs and the inspiration of DSPy and PyTorch is one of the biggest themes to understand to wrap your head around what DSPy is, why it's so exciting, and why it's ushering in this new era of LLM program optimization. So with neural networks and PyTorch, we would stack up layers in order to optimize neural networks and get to where we are today with transformers. And so basically what that looked like back in the day is you would have, say, six layers of convolution and then maybe, you know, pooling would be interwoven with that and, and you'd flatten it and have three layers of convolution. So you had this layer design for how you would compose a neural network. And now with LLM programs, we similarly have this layer design in DSPy where we break a task up into subtasks and each subtask is a layer in your program. So say you're trying to turn a question into an entire blog post, and then you have as input the question and the first layer takes the question and turns it into say an outline or, or does a retrieval and does some research about the topic before then the next layer turns it into an outline. And then say you have a loop here where you loop through each of the topics and flush that out into a full paragraph. And then maybe you proofread it or write a title for it. So you have layers in the decomposition of your task into subtasks and DSPy fits the same <laughs> layer model from PyTorch and optimizes each layer by using these optimizers. So we're gonna have, first we're gonna start with a conceptual overview of what that means to add depth to DSPy programs. And then we have two demos, Jupyter Notebooks, walking through the examples with some tests and hopefully further explaining the concept. So that will transition us really nicely into further motivating the power of the DSPy optimizers. Particularly this video is gonna take a deep dive into Bootstrap ViewShot. So to maybe just kind of break apart the name Bootstrap ViewShot to help communicate what it's doing, we're bootstrapping a trace through our program by taking one of the inputs that we give it and then using the highest capacity model we can find say typically GPT-4, Gemini Pro 1.5, I don't mean to open up the box of what's the most powerful language model, but say let's just say GPT-4. And so you would take your inputs, like say you have one example of a question, and you would run it through your question to blog program. And now for each layer, each component in your program, you have an input output example to then plug into the prompt to use for future inferences. And having these few shot or input output examples in the prompt, where you then will plug in your, your new inference at the end of the prompt, so you have the task description here, that will dramatically help with the with the output of this input because it's seeing this behavior of what it's supposed to do with the input. So you bootstrap input example, output examples, few shot examples in context learning by running the most powerful model you can find or, or you know, on a budget, whatever, <laughs> however you're designing these systems through the program and then that's where you get the examples from. So we'll dive deep into how that works. We'll look at the code and then we'll see how you interface individual examples with higher level optimizers, starting with the simple case of random search where you're randomly searching for, say you have four examples from, you know, four traces. You have these, or let's say you had eight traces and you're using four examples in the prompt. What are the optimal four? So, <laughs> so that's where you then use random search or Bayesian optimization with Optuna to find those perfect four. Then we'll dive into a concept I think is super exciting, super powerful DSPy, multi-model DSPy programs. So say certain, certain subtasks in your tasks require the reasoning capability of GPT-4, whereas others only require, say, the smaller, cheaper, faster models like the Mistral 7B or Llama 2. So we'll look at what it means to compose multi-model DSPy programs, as well as some coding examples. So then we have two demos, 
the two Jupyter Notebook demos, first of all, benchmarking some deeper RAG system designs, and then looking at a four layer program to convert questions into blog posts. The notebooks used in this DSPy tutorial series can be found on Weaviate Recipes. This is a group effort with 10 contributors. And if you'd like to join the list of contributors and have an example of using Weaviate and DSPy or Weaviate and you know any other technology, then please feel free to open a pull, requ pull request and I'd be more than happy to look at it. So let's kick things off with some DSPy community notes, some news about DSPy. So starting off, we have a new paper from Yijia Xiao and others, as well as Omar Khattab, Storm, assisting in writing Wikipedia-like articles from scratch with large language models. This is an eight layer DSPy system that, you know, basically is a better version of the demo that I'm gonna show you at the end, but that takes topics and fleshes them out into Wikipedia length articles. So <laughs> there are so many things to this that fascinate me about it. First of all, I think broadly in terms of what the AI systems do, currently we have a wave of chatbots or super powerful search engines like Perplexity. And I think now we're gonna see just a new wave of AI generated content. Say every time you have a pull request, the documentation is updated or, you know, as shown in this, this exact example, you can generate blog posts from entire topics. So I think we're really, you know, stepping into an exciting era of AI. I really personally like these kind of text generation applications. And so I think this is an amazing system. There are all sorts of novel ideas as well, such as how they use perspective guided question asking to do the research of the topics to write these articles. And, you know, they're the, some of the world's top scientists. So they did a really great job of comparing GPT-4 with GPT Turbo. Uh, they use Mistral 7B Instruct as judge in this kind of multi-model system. And so it's pretty rigorous and there's a lot of great details. So I highly recommend reading that paper. Next up, I really enjoyed listening to Arnav Singh V, hosted by Demetrios Brinkman at the ML Ops community presenting DSPy Assertions. So DSPy Assertions is kind of DSPy's take on structured output following, or more broadly, it could be, so usually structured output following is referencing JSON and, and you know, having the right keys or say uh, the language model is supposed to return a list of ints. And so you're trying to enforce that it returns a list of ints so that, you know, you can then parse it in the next step of your program. So DSPy assertions has these two uh, controls in DSPy, DSPy.suggest and DSPy.assert that will either stop the program from continuing to execute or continuing to pass. But using this kind of suggestion in the optimization, you have this retry module. And so I thought Arnav did an amazing job presenting this. And Demetrios is an amazing host. He brings a ton of personality to this MLOps community thing. And so I, it was just so much fun to watch. And I hope there will be a recording soon that I can link in the uh, community markdown that I'm going to show you in a second. But uh, so next up, uh, Thomas Ale. The Pydantic signatures pull request was merged. There are examples of this in example slash functional in the Stanford NLP DSPy repository. Uh, so I'm still not an expert on this, but this is one approach to using Pydantic base models and having this validation and things like this. So Thomas is definitely ahead of me on this, but this is something that I think was just an amazing effort and is definitely something that I have on my to-do list to learn more about. Next up, another paper uh, shared by Omar the unreasonable effectiveness of eccentric automatic prompts from Battle and Gallipudi. And it was published, uh, I think, uh, like two weeks ago. So the idea of this paper is really profound. This is about how silly nuanced these prompts can get to achieve better behavior. So one of the most popular data sets that's being used to benchmark, uh, benchmark large language models is GSM 8K. It's like math questions. And so when you're searching for that prompt, and remember the, the, the idea of DSPy, there's so a few ideas, but one of the ideas is we're optimizing the task description as well as those a few shot input output examples. And so they're optimizing the task description to perform optim optimally at these uh, uh, math questions. And so it ends up finding something about Star Trek. Like it puts, you know, you are a huge fan of Star Trek. <laughs> this is like something that gets put into the prompt and maximizes performance on the, on the math benchmark. So this is this paper is a great example of how you know, these non-deterministic language models, it's kind of similar. Another tweet I saw about this is comparing this to Francois Chalet's analogy of, you know, key value neural networks and how these super high dimensional manifolds of key value. And so adding things like you're a Star Trek fan, that helps you get on the key in the manifold of this crazy high dimensional space. So it's a really interesting paper that I think underpins a lot of the you know, programming, not prompting, controlling these language models. You don't want to manual, like you were probably never going to find that if you're just manually tweaking your prompt, <laughs> you were probably never going to find the Star Trek thing. So it's a great testimony, I think, to 
DSPy. So next up, I think a really interesting thing is Aiden Gomez, CEO, founder of Cohere, co-founder of Cohere, opening up a pull request, adding Cohere embeddings to DSPy. I think it's a great indicator of the interest in the DSPy framework, obviously Aiden being one of the leaders of artificial intelligence. And so generally, I think it's just a great signal of, you know, the, the interest in DSPy and the potential it has. Finally, I want to share an example that I thought, think is just super exciting. Self-Discover is a new paper that came out from the Google Brain Research team, including Kwok Lee, who's one of the top scientists in AI. And we have an implementation in DSPy by Chris Dossman. Uh, Chris and I also recorded a podcast on this that will be featured on the WeVA podcast pretty soon. Uh, and this is the Self-Discover thing is... I mean, as we talked earlier about inductive biases and inductive biases prior knowledge now being carried into uh, lay, uh, subtask design and prompt design and DSPy programs, you have this thing called chain of thought. So chain of thought is let's think step by step. Another kind of primitive like this could be let's think out of the box or let's think symbolically to calculate um, you know, an answer. And so self-discover is about searching th for, for those uh, like, you know, those thinking primitives, I want to call them priors on how you think about a problem. And then you kind of stack that with the instructions as well. It's a super level kind of meta prompting way of thinking about uh, combining chain of thought and the search for chain of thought like things. So just overall something that I think is really interesting. Another thing I want to touch on quickly before diving further into DSPy, something I'm super excited about, the Gorilla LLM's Berkeley Function Calling Leaderboard is now live. Uh, so this is a question I'm seeing a lot in the DSPy Discord is people who want to use function calling within their DSPy programs. So you want to interface functions as JSONs or in a second, I'll also show you some ideas around text to SQL models that people want to plug into their DSPy programs. So what this is from Berkeley is it's a leaderboard of benchmarking of how well, different uh, LLMs follow the you know the the JSON templates of different functions. So you can see that GBT four zero one two five previous at the top of the leaderboard. The open functions, the Gorilla LLM, uh, not too far behind. And then you have say Turbo, Mistral Medium, Anthropics Cloud. So I think this is a super useful contribution and very relevant to people building DSPy programs as well. So then another thing I wanted to quickly talk about is. Uh, the question about people looking for the particular model for some particular task. So maybe instead of uh, compiling, you know, any arbitrary model for a task, maybe you want to use one of these specific models. So I quickly just want to point people to the model hub on Olama. It's amazing. Olama is what we're going to use in the demo in a second. Uh, so if you say search SQL, you're looking for a text SQL model. They have models like this. There's all sorts of models on the Olama model hub. So I just wanted to quickly point people to these two resources quickly, uh, the Gorilla open function calling leaderboard, and then, uh, you know, point to the Olama model catalog. One last note before moving on from the DSPy community and news update is I'm really sorry if I left out your contribution to DSPy. It is tricky trying to cut this into, say, five things to present in these videos. And originally I had a list of like 30 things that I wanted to go through. So instead I've moved those into this markdown file, uh, weaviate slash recipes slash integration slash DSPy slash community. So if you want to have your uh, your contribution to DSPy, cool projects you're building, examples or papers, podcasts, videos. Uh, please open a pull request to Weaviate Recipes, and I'll take a look and integrate it and be sure to try to share with people and be aware of your work generally. Uh, one comment on this is that I think it's important that we sort these things alphabetically to avoid any kind of bias of the order that you present things in. So please don't name your <laughs> example AA DSPy tutorial and we should be all set. So I hope you check this out and that's the end of the DSPy news and community update. Let's dive into some concepts. Let's shift gears into some deep dives into technical concepts. We'll start off with what it means to add depth to DSPy programs and particularly we're going to look at this through the lens of adding depth to retrieval augmented generation program systems typically used for question answering or chatbots. So we'll kick it off with basic retrieval augmented generation. This is typically where you take a query, pass it into a retriever and then have a question answering LLM. So we're highlighting retrieve highlighted in white as a non-parametric tool in our system, whereas highlighted in black is the answer, which is an LLM or say a parametric part of our DSPy program. The answer contains a prompt if we're doing discrete optimization, or maybe we put gradients if we're doing gradient descent based optimization, but we're gonna leave that out of the scope for this video generally. So when we have one of these modules highlighted by sh shaded in with black and a white circle, like answer in this particular visual you're seeing now, that means that we have a prompt of how it's supposed to answer the question. So in our current scope of thinking about DSPy in this video, we're thinking about the task description, like 
assess the context and answer the question, as well as input output examples of questions, maybe context from previous retrievals, and then their answers. So now let's graduate from basic RAG to RAG with result processing. So now we've added two layers to our retrieval augmented generation system. We take the query, we pass it into retrieval, and then say we have some kind of parametric system to process the results, and then we answer the question. So say we want to summarize the context before we answer it, or say we have a re-ranking model that's going to resort the context, these kind of processings before we answer the question, we've added one more layer to our DSPy system. So now processing results, say we're summarizing the, the context before answering the question. Now our two programs have different task instructions. This one would say your task is to summarize the information in the context to help answer a question, whereas the answer thing has assess the context and answer the question. And they both have different input output examples for, <laughs> for each of the two tasks. And that's the idea. As you stack these programs, you would have different output exam output examples for each of the tasks that you know compose this program. So next up, we have query and result processing. So say we take the query and then we pass it into a prompt with something like your task is to take a query as well as context and reformulate it into a better question or a question that will better help answer the original question. So now you have a prompt in the process query. And again, you have input output examples of what it means to take a question in context and formula formulate a new query. And then you similarly have the say search results summarization or the question answerer. Next up, with DSPy programming, we can use the primitives of programming. And that's one of the most exciting things is we can say loop through this part of the program. So say we originally take the question and the, the we take the question and then we process it into a new question and then we retrieve and then we process those results by summarizing them. And then we say feed this back into the second loop as we have our loop counter, the second iteration of taking in the current results, the previous question, say the history of what we did in this first loop and using that to then do one more loop. And then we feed all that context into our question answering system. And now things get even more interesting because Again, programming language models, not prompting them. We can say that, you know, certain loops should run asynchronously from each other. Like later when we'll look at the, uh, the, the question to blog, uh, example, you might want to do your research of each of the topics asynchronously from each other. And then later on you have some kind of waiting or, you know, locking could be involved with this kind of thing. So you could have this asynchronous loop. You can program these DSPy programs, how you would program any Python system. Whereas we're adding depth to individual programs in DSPy, our DSPy systems may consist of multiple programs. So say we have this uh, three layer with asynchronous looping RAG system, and then it's interfaced with an LLM metric. A simple LLM metric with one layer would just take the answer, maybe some other information about a gold answer or something like that as it was a prompt on how to judge it. Say, is it detailed? Is it grounded in the context? And then it will make the judgment. Another idea for this would be to stack judging the answer and then parsing the float rating, achieving structured output parsing with this kind of two layer DSPy programming. Uh, this is kind of similar to how DSPy assertions is designed. And I really just kind of sketch, sketch this together to show the concept of having two programs, say with, e with one with three layers and one with two layers, and hopefully getting that concept across of how LM metrics are used. You also might have uh, the prompt model as we get into the Bayesian signature optimizer, that could be a two layer system, but, or you could inspect the metric, but let's keep it simple for now and understand the concept of adding layers to DSPy programs. All right, so now let's dive into multi-model DSPy programs. I think this is an absolutely fascinating topic. I'm not claiming to have a full, full understanding of the scope of this. The potential of this, I think is just unbounded. <laughs> we hardly understand this idea really. I mean, you could have GPT-4 answers the question, but Llama 2s, they do the looping of generating questions, summarizing results. And then the metrics could be say cohere command and cloud working together. So <laughs> we have all these LMs that you can orchestrate together with DSPy. So here's a little example of this, just a visual of what I just said, basically, where you could have Mistral 7B is the language model behind processing the query as well as processing the results. And then say GPT-4 is the answerer. And then say when you're judging the question, say you have coheres command nightly is what judges the answer. And then GPT-4 just parses the float rating from the response to ensure the structured output is followed. So then you can compile, uh, compose these multi-model, multi-program DSPy systems where you have the RAG program that has Mistral 7B and GPT-4, and then it gets the metric from command nightly, GPT-4. And I'd call this a generative feedback loop. This is something that we're pushing at Weaviate, a, a term that we think really describes this next generation of 
artificial intelligence systems where AI models, you know, work with each other to either, you know, generate things and save it back into the databases and just keep building on it. So I'd call, I'd say generative feedback loop is a great abstraction for thinking about how this one system is producing an answer, this other system is judging it, generative systems and feeding back into each other, there may be saving outputs. So here's an example of that. At the time of recording this video, there are nine available optimizers in DSPy, and I'll let you pause the video and read them all if you like. But here's, I think, the core idea of them. And labeled few shot means that you have examples of inputs and outputs in your data set that you curated, and you wanna use those input outputs in the prompt for your program. Now, bootstrap view shot means you only have inputs. And another interesting thing about this is, you know, you might have inputs, outputs, like if you have a question and then you have the answer you want, you have those input, that input output, but you don't have inputs, outputs for every part of that uh, DSPy program, which hopefully the first part of this video kind of helped bring that concept home. So bootstrap view shot is, in my view, just the quickest value add of DSPy, where you're gonna run an LLM through your program like GPT-4, and they're gonna use the inputs, outputs of the trace of that to then bootstrap in your program. And there's further con quality controls of those traces that we're gonna look at in a second as we step into the code of exactly how the Bootstrap FewShot optimizer works. So Bootstrap FewShot is searching through for those few shot examples. Now, let's say you have 30 questions in your data set and you wanna have four examples in the prompt of each of your program. Now you have this question of what are the optimal four to be including in your program? This is now when we introduce these uh, discrete optimizers that are typically used in hyperparameter optimization. I think say a lot of the stuff from weights and biases is gonna translate fantastically to DSPy, where we already have this kind of experiment tracking, you know, visualization and, these, and this kind of stuff in place. So that's definitely something I'm really excited about. But so random search is you're just randomly searching for four and you just measure the performance. Whatever is the best is the best. Optuna uses Bayesian optimization. So Bayesian optimization you have, and you know, this is a deep one and a lot of people have made a lot of success out of really understanding Bayesian optimization thoroughly and I'm not one of those people, but basically the idea is that you have a prior and a posterior over the expected performance of each of the, you know, the discrete options. So say you have, you know, let's just say A, B, C, and D and then you have a prior on the performance, and then say you evaluate A and B in tandem, now you have A posterior on the, con the contribution of A, and then you'll use that to wait if you wanna, uh, then you'll also say do A and C and B and C, and then you can have updated posteriors on A and B jointly in their association with C, and so this kind of guides the how you sort the probability of, uh, of each of the examples being something that is fruitful to explore again, or whether you should truncate it. So there is a library called Optuna, and I think you know most of us, me included, obviously, will just use this library and sort of you know back off of the theory of Bayesian optimization. But I think just to have a sense of it, you're you're trying to assign some weight to each of the examples. It's not just random search where you learn nothing from your experiments with each of the options. And so hopefully that's a good explanation of it. Uh, so then we have signature optimizer. So Again, we're, we're looking at two types of optimization generally. We're either looking to tweak the task description or we're looking to tweak the examples used in the prompt. So the signature optimizer is gonna be using another LLM to write paraphrasings of the initial task that you give it and then search for how well that does with performance. The Bayesian signature optimizer, that's the heavy hitter right now with DSPy's optimizer. That's gonna jointly use Bayesian optimization and few shot example search as well as uh, task search. I'll save a deep dive of that for a future video. And then uh, also, yeah, so Bootstrap fine tune is where you're fine tuning with gradients using say synthetic input output examples. And so we'll save the rest of these for a future video. So from the DSPy documentation, you have a recommendation on which optimizer you should use for your DSPy program based on how many examples of your tasks that you have. So if you have 10 examples, the prescription is to use Bootstrap FewShot. If you have 50, then you bring in the random search optimization. If you have 300, now you graduate to the Bayesian signature optimizer and bootstrap fine tuning is generally recommended for the sake of efficiency. So fine tuning with gradients will always probably, probably, <laughs> I don't know, but it'll probably persist as a storyline because you can compress the models for these specific tasks in theory. Like you, if you have say the 2 billion parameter Gemma model on Hugging Face, you could fine tune it to do that uh, query rewriting task or the summarization task. And now you have a 2 billion parameter model, which is way more efficient to then serve I think the the jury is still out on um, 
you know, whether fine tuning with gradients is going to be as powerful as sort of discrete optimization with the continued iteration of open source foundation models. Like I would personally need to learn a little more about that 6.7 billion parameter rule on whether that's if this, so there's this paper about quantization. Uh, I think Tim Detmers is behind it that says that there's something, some magic to this 6.7 billion parameter number where, you know, if the model is more than that, then it's capable of this reasoning thing. And, you know, so I'm, I'm not super familiar with that research, but anyways, <laughs> so it's recommended for efficiency. Okay, let's dive into the code for two of the optimizers that I think will greatly improve your understanding of DSPy optimization. And hopefully from there, you can take your depth of knowledge on the optimizers to however far you want to take it. All right, so let's kick things off with the PowerPoint slide where we just look at the high level of what it's doing, and then we'll go into the code itself. So starting off with labeled few shot, you start off with these default values for how many examples you're going to be uh, bootstrapping into the input outputs. And that's a super important one to tune, especially as we'll see with the uh, with the demo, as we're, say, uh, optimizing the summary, the context summaries. If you have too many examples now, you, you know, you have a massive input window. But anyway, so we have K equals 16 by default. And what labeled few shot is doing is it's bootstrapping. It's adding input output examples that you have given the system. Just it's just putting those into the prompt. So if you add the sampling parameter, it'll add K random samples from the training set you've given it. Otherwise, it'll just add as many as you do have. Okay, so next up, the bootstrap few shot. So now the key difference between labeled few shot and bootstrap few shot is that you're using the teacher to create the example. So if you don't pass in an alternate teacher program or you know settings for a new LLM to serve as the teacher, it will just make a copy of the student program, the program that you're currently trying to compile, and then it will just do traces through that program to, to put in the input for then itself later. So if it if the teacher, if you've compiled it already, and this is set with an underscore compiled equals true variable, and Omar, I'm sorry that I asked you so many times to remind me of, of that, but if it's not already compiled, the teacher will initialize itself by running labeled few shot, and we'll take a look at that as well. Uh, so then you have rounds similar to epoch. So rounds is the iterations, and yeah, it's a very similar concept to epochs. And the way that the concept really comes together is you have a, a metric on whether, you know, you have a metric that you're passing into your optimizer. And if you have a Boolean metric, then you have a simple true or false of whether this example gets added to the return set. And now you can also use a metric threshold. <laughs> I added a smiley face because I personally added that one to the framework and I'm quite proud of it. But so you can now add a uh, less uh, a value and then if it's a uh, float rating if it has to be greater than say 4.5 in order to be added to the return set so you basically just loop through the examples in the train set and then once the length of the bootstrap is greater than the max bootstrap parameter you gave it then you're finished okay so here we are in stanford nlp slash dspy we can see omar is hard at work merging pull requests and let's dive into the dspy teleprompters so we go to dspy slash teleprompters and here we are all right so first let's take a look at the labeled few shot optimizer. So zoom in a bit to make this easier to see. All right, so the labeled few shot teleprompter, again, it's gonna have a default value K equals 16, and then it's gonna have the compile function. So the compile function is gonna take in the student, the program that you wanna optimize. Uh, this just denotes that you have to have these as named keyword arguments. So then, oops, sorry. So then it has the training set and then the sample parameter with default set to true. Uh, so first you're gonna copy the, the student model uh, program, sorry. Then you have the training set. Uh, then you're going to check if the training set is zero, return just the student. Uh, this is so you're going to, uh, I think, the, oh, this is, sorry, this sets the random seed. Uh, so then you're looping through the predictors and the students. The predictors, so within DSPy, you, you, the compiler, each program under the hood, it has the predictors, and then each of the predictors has, say, demos. So it has these kind of, uh, these named attributes, which is how it's going to format the demo into the prompt when it's kind of like uh, formatting the signature for inference. It, we'll say that one for a future video. But uh, so what you're going to do, oh, well, this kind of gives you it right away. So, so we're looping through the predictor and predictors. So this is like the number of parametric parts of your system, the number of prompts that you need to optimize, If let's say it like that. And then so with each predictor, you have predictor.demos. And this is the attribute that stores the examples that you're putting into the uh, the program, per, uh, the predictors, the program, the component. You know, I, I definitely am back and forth with what particularly I call each of these things. But anyway, so 
So you're just randomly sampling from the training set and then you, you know you just add it. And if you don't have sampling, you just take the first K from the training set and then you return the student. Okay, so hopefully that gives you the sense of the labeled few shot, just going through it and taking K examples from the, uh, from the training set and using that and putting those as the demos, the input output examples of each predictor in your program that you're optimizing. Okay, so now let's take on a more difficult one, the bootstrap few shot compiler. Okay, so with Bootstrap ViewShot, right out of the gate, we have a little more to it. So we have, we're passing in our metric now because we're gonna be evaluating the candidate input-output examples to see if they're any good to be included in our, you know, our input-output demonstrations. Uh, we have the teacher settings, which is gonna be a dictionary of, uh, of settings for the teacher, like the language model that we're gonna be using. This is a super important parameter, the max number of Bootstrap demos, which is how many uh, of the traces through the program with the teacher model that we're gonna be putting into the prompt. Then we have the maximum number of labeled demos. So, so you may uh, want a hybrid of input outputs that you've written as well as that you've you know synthetically traced by running the teacher model through your program. And uh, then we have max rounds, which is uh, similar to epochs. And then we have max errors, which is how many times it's gonna fail one of these assertions before you stop optimizing. Okay, so we just set all these values. Uh, we have the error lock, which is how we're locking, you know, we, we, so we have multi-threaded uh, bootstrapping and then say you have an error on one end, so you lock everything, update the error counter, unlock, keep going with the multi-threading. Anyways, okay, so now we're compiling. So again, we have this notion of, uh, you know, include the keyword n n arguments when you're setting this up. Uh, okay, so first thing we do is we step into prepare student and teacher. So what this is doing, Sorry, is it's uh, is it's um, it's compiling the teacher if the teacher is not already compiled with the labeled few shot thing. So uh, the programs they have this underscore compiled flag, which tells it whether it's com already been compiled or not. And if it hasn't, then uh, then you're gonna compile the the teacher a little bit with that uh, labeled few shot. And again, the K is gonna be the self dot max labeled demos. So say you don't have a training set at all, you, you just put uh, zero here and then you're all set and you know, we'll just use zero. Uh, and then and it'll just have a zero shot forward pass with your teacher. Okay, so the next thing that we do is uh, where we're gonna prepare the mappings. So what we're doing in this function is we're just kind of uh, mapping the, the teacher to the student. So we're uh, th so you have to make sure they have the same program structure and you just kind of map from the, uh, the name of the predictor. It's just, I think you just have two key values such that you can take the teacher output and just use these key values to then, uh, to just access it later. Okay, so hopefully that was a good explanation of that. So now we're stepping into bootstrap. Uh, so bootstrap, you have that max bootstrap thing. So let me even zoom out. Uh, so you have that max bootstraps hyperparameter that you gave it, how many uh, traces that you want to include in the example. You have this dictionary of the successful bootstrapped examples that we'll look at later with how you append to it. Uh, so then you're looping through the maximum number of rounds. Okay, so for the example in the in the training set, so we're looping through the training set just like epochs and training neural networks. Uh, so first we're going to check if we've, oh, sorry, if we've bootstrapped more examples than the max bootstrap. And if so, then break, we're finished. Uh, but if not, then we're going to bootstrap. So we're going to call the helper function of bootstrap one example. So let's step into bootstrap one example. So with bootstrap one example, uh, we have the name to traces. This is again, tying with that key value thing we used earlier to align the teacher and the student. Uh, so then we have the teacher and then we have our predictor cache. Okay. So Here's the first thing to note is the with DSPI settings dot, uh, context. This is how, this is the syntax for how you use different LLMs in your, how you have multi-model DSPI programs. We'll see this a bit in a perhaps simpler example in the demo in the notebook in a second, but this is how you use a different model for the teacher than the student. Okay. So here's a really interesting detail of this. You have similar, so with neural network optimization, one of the most common techniques was to have a learning rate warm up. So learning rate is when you have the gradient of the loss function, you then multiply that by the learning rate as well as like the partial derivative of each of the weights with respect to that loss. And so you would uh, warm up the learning rate during training. Like you, you know, you'd go like one E minus one E minus four up to one E minus two and then back down or you have cyclical learning rate. So you have this, the temperature in the teacher model that's used to trace this, the uh, trace through the program. That's that temperature is being compared to learning rates and you have this kind of warm-up scheduling which i think is quite interesting 
Okay, so then we just, you know, we have the settings, we run through, the teacher takes the example dot inputs, and then we have the trace. I'm actually not sure what the trace is used for yet, so uh, we're gonna pause that one. I'm pretty sure it's used in the metric, but we'll save that later. Uh, so, okay, so now this is the new thing <laughs> that I helped contribute a bit to, so I'm very proud of this. Uh, so, so you have the metric, so if you just have a Boolean metric, then you just uh, then you just plug in the example and the, the prediction that just came from the teacher into it, probably like trace equals none. I, I'm not sure yet what the trace does again. Uh, so if you have the metric threshold, then say this is a float value that comes out of the metric, then you is it greater than or equal to the metric threshold? And if not, you don't even bother with that, it's just return the Boolean value. And if you don't have a metric at all, then just success is true. Uh, so if there is an error, then again, you're going to lock all the threads that are bootstrapping examples and incre increment the error counter. And if it's greater than the maximum errors, then, you know, panic, crash the program. Okay, so now if success, um, oh, okay, so the, sorry, the trace, I, <laughs> the trace is what you're using to then take the predictors and the demos out of the forward pass of the teacher. Uh, Anyway, anyway, so that might be, that detail might not be super interesting. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll dive further into that. Hopefully, just seeing it is helping and <laughs> talking through this. Uh, okay, great. So, okay, so hopefully you see from here how you do the name to tracers. Uh, we get the predictor. We have the predictor dot name that we took from self dot predictor to name ID. Okay, so we use that key value from earlier. Okay, hopefully all of this makes sense. Okay, so <laughs> so now that was our Bootstrap one example. So again, so success is bootstrap one example and success is whether it either, you know, true or false of the Boolean metric or if it's greater than the metric threshold or just true if you don't have a metric at all. And so if success, then you add the bootstrapped example ID, IDX to equals true to this dictionary and you're gonna interface as you then abstract this one layer higher with random search and Optuna, you're gonna then interface these different uh, dictionaries of, you know, here's the example index and the bootstrapped uh, example. So. Okay. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so bootstrapped lend boots. So this is something that will print as you're compiling this. So what it's doing is it's bootstrapping the length of, uh, it's saying it bootstrapped. How, so it's looping through this and it's, it's done break once you have more of the bootstrap. So then it's just the length of the numbers bootstrap, which is going to be the same value as this. Uh, unless I guess you loop through the whole thing. Okay, so let's say you always fail to bootstrap and then it, you only get like two out of four, right? After you uh, go through the whole training set, right? And so it's so like two and then after example IDX plus one. So this is how many of the examples in your training set needed to loop through to, to get those examples. And this is what like epoch round it's on. Uh, okay, so then you get the validation and you'll interface this validation. You'll use the dev set and the validation metric as you then graduate from uh, from just the bootstrap few shot atomic thing to then stacking it with the Optuna random search. I'm super excited to share two notebooks that are gonna help explain the concept of adding depth to DSPy programs. As always, these notebooks can be found in Weaviate slash recipes slash integration slash DSPy. The first of which is gonna be exploring this concept through the lens of retrieval augmented generation. The second of which is a joint effort with Erica Cardenas at Weaviate, where we're gonna be taking questions and writing entire blog posts with a four layer DSPy program. So I'm so excited to be showing you this uh, demo experiment that I've run on exploring this concept of adding depth to retrieval augmented generation. So I'm sure many uh, viewers of this video are familiar with the kind of vanilla rag, if you will, of just kind of retrieve and then generating an answer from the retrieved context. In this case, we have a one layer DSPy program where we just have this generate answer uh, prompt or say it could be a fine tuned LLM. I don't mean to limit DSPy by only thinking about kind of task and input output, you know, discrete kind of prompt optimization. You also could have gradient descent tuning, but for so far in our video series, we're mostly just looking at prompt tuning. And so I'm going to kind of uh, just stick with that kind of prompt tuning framing for how we're thinking about this optimization for now. Okay, so we're going to be exploring four different variants of RAG. So in addition to the vanilla retrieve then read, we're then going to be exploring retrieve, then summarize the context, and then generate the answer. So already we're hopefully starting to understand this idea of adding inductive biases into our program. It's intuitive to think that uh, you know if you first summarize the search results into relevant information and then answer the question, you've decomposed the task to make it easier to then um, answer the question. So then we're going to be exploring a really powerful system. This is one of the first examples that you'll see when you're on Stanford NLP slash DSPy. 
is the multi-hop rag system, and particularly this baleen architecture from Kitab et al., published in about uh, 2021, I think, where you have this uh, loop where you uh, take the initial question, then you do retrieval, and then you take the initial question in the retrieve context as input to produce a second query. And then you will use that query as the next query to retrieve from, and then you'll loop however many times. In this case, we'll experiment with two loops, and then you'll feed all that context into the uh, generate answer prompt. So I think this is just such an exciting kind of idea. I think this is really related to the auto GBT sort of idea that really just had super captured the public imagination when it came out of this idea of having this kind of looping where you're where the LLM is looping and then it's prompted to say, you know, have I gathered enough material? Am, should I finish looping or should I keep doing my research? And so in this case, we don't have this autonomous loop, however often that you, you know, that you think you need to. In this case, we're going to be fixing the number of times to loop, which is going to be two times. Then finally, our most complex system, our three-layer RAG system, is going to be looping through, asking the question, then retrieving with the new question, and then summarizing the context. So we're adding this summarized context as an inductive bias to hopefully, you know, tame the search results as we're doing this looping and question asking. Because uh, say we've asked three questions and, and we're taking five search results per question. Now all of a sudden we have, you know, 15 search results that we're going to be trying to feed into the generate answer. We've seen papers like Lost in the Middle, Greg Kamrat's Needle in the Haystack experiments that suggest it's probably better to try to summarize and compress the information from all these search results before we generate an answer. So next up, we're going to be using a two-layer DSPy program to evaluate the answers that come from our different RAG systems. So this is an example of using a specialized LLM prompt to enforce structured output parsing. So we first have the judge and answer prompt where you have different criteria on to judge the quality of a generated answer, like how detailed is it, how well grounded in the context is it, or uh, how well aligned is it with the gold answer. And now we have a second LLM prompt that's going to be parsing a float or ensuring that a float is outputted from the original response from the uh, judgment LLM. So oftentimes what happens is the LLM will say, maybe, sure, I can help you with that at four, right? Or it'll say like 4.5 out of five, and then you can no longer parse it because the 4.5 out of five, you can't just cast that into a float. So this is one way of achieving structured output parsing. We're definitely going to be covering uh, DSPy assertions in a future video on this channel. But for now, here's kind of an easy way to achieve uh, structured output parsing. We're going to compare each of these four RAG systems with each other by optimizing each of them with the Bootstrap View Shot Optimizer. And we're going to be using the Max Bootstrap uh, Demos hyperparameter to, to set to be four for each of the components in our program. So this means that, say, in the case of multi hop RAG with Summarizer, we have four examples of asking questions by taking the context and then the original question and then producing that reasoning with the chain of thought prompt and then producing the new query. We similarly do this for summarizing context as well as generating the answer. And we'll take a look at exactly what that looks like uh, in a second, maybe towards the end, because it is, it's a very long prompt, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. We're also going to explore the Bayesian signature optimizer on the most complex program, the multi-hop ride with summarizer. All right, so next up is something that I think um, almost sort of made me hesitant to publish this video because I wanted, you know, I was biased in wanting the story to be just clear cut. Adding depth is just instantly makes it better. But I think actually there is just so much nuance to this and particularly in the LLM metric. And so this will be probably more clear in a second as we look at how the LLM metric is computing, is rating the quality of these answers. And I think it's, you know, it's definitely worth thinking further about LLM evaluation. And, you know, this whole, like, what does it mean to judge the quality of an answer? I think it's certainly more nuanced than just asking the LLM, like, <laughs> how detailed is it or how grounded in initial context is it? Because, uh, like, the multi-hop rag system, it's it's doing multiple retrievals. So if, you, if you're asking it how, how well is this answer supported by the context and you just did an initial retrieval, then, you know, the, the context that it found by doing the looping of multi-hop, it's not going to be contained in that retrieval. So I think, you know, I definitely have a long way to go in my understanding of LM metrics, but that's kind of more so what I think is producing these results. And so I, I, these are the results, but, you know, I'm not presenting this as like a research paper. I'm presenting this as like, here's the notebook for the code and how this was set up. Uh, but, so one thing I do think is interesting generally, though, is observing the uncompiled performance as well. I think 
a lot can be said about uh, just kind of tweaking this uncompiled performance before you then compile it and seeing these correlations. It'll be really interesting to just see how these kind of experiments play out as more and more people start, you know, experimenting with multiple configurations of systems, multiple LLMs, all this kind of stuff. So, so we'll look at, we'll look further at this as we get through the notebook. But so the next thing I want to highlight quickly is the length of the prompts when we're using the Bayesian signature optimizer on multi hop ride with summarizer. So we end up with about 4,000 tokens for the query writer, about 3,200 tokens for the summarize and about 4,300 tokens for uh, the generate answer prompt. So, uh, so I put the full optimized prompts at the bottom of the notebook, but let's actually take a quick look at that before we continue on with the notebook. Okay, so I think by taking a look at this, you'll have a better sense of uh, what it means to be adding input outputs to the prompts as well as to be tweaking uh, the, the task description. So with the Bayesian signature optimizer, we start off with a prompt like write a search query that will help answer a question. And then we have the uh, structured input outputs follow the following format, context, question, reasoning, query. And this is a really interesting part of it is this chain of thought reasoning. So when we're doing this uh, bootstrap view shot, not only do we get examples of what it means to take the inputs of a context in a question and produce the output of a new query, we also get this reasoning about how to think about the problem. And because we're doing these traces with the most high capacity model we can find, like GPT-4, we end up with a really strong reasoning that we put in this prompt to then help guide, say, a cheaper model like Mistral 7B or GPT Turbo to perform this task. So we see how we add these examples of reasoning. So like, let's think step by step in order to produce the query. We need to identify the specific syntax error in the provided GraphQL query example related to the evaluation of n-gram matches. This error could be preventing the query from successfully executing or achieving the intended results specified in the natural language command. So anyways, even aside from me reading it to you, hopefully you get this idea of you're bootstrapping not only input output, so this is all the context, and then this is the question, and then this is the, the query that GPT-4, you know, the higher capacity model produces. In this case, we're just gonna be using Turbo for every part of the uh, optimization, but we are gonna be using Mistral, and we're gonna be using Cohere command in the uh, judge. But anyway, so hopefully you see this example of how you have, you know, reasonings in each of the, in each of the input outputs. So similarly, we have this for the summarize prompt. Now, in the case of the summarize prompt, the Bayesian signature optimizer has rewritten the initial task description. So I think I started off with something like, please summarize the context to help answer a question. And the Bayesian signature optimizer rewrites the task description to, given the context in the question, distill the context into a succinct summary. You know, I, I think you can, you can pause it and read it if you like, but here is just another example of what it means to be tweaking the task description as well as providing these input output examples with the added chain of thought reasoning in each of those input output examples to then guide it for the new inference. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's dive into some of the code. So we start off by importing DSPy and we're gonna be importing the Weaviate retrieval model and then we're gonna be importing the Weaviate client and OpenAI. So we use OpenAI to pass in our API key, which I've <laughs> deleted from the notebook, but you would just have uh, like, you know, openai.api key equals, and then you put in your API key like that. Okay, so then we connect to two LLMs. And this is the first thing I want to kind of show with this video. Something that I found to be really useful with building multi-model DSPy systems is to name each of the models like this. So, you know, say you also had uh, GPT-4, or say you had Mistral API, you're connecting directly to Mistral's API, or maybe uh, Grok, Grok, G-R-O-Q, I don't know how to pronounce that, but, <laughs> but anyway, so I, I think it's very useful to have this kind of uh, naming of the models that you're using. For example, you can call them like this, and then later on, we'll see with the with dspy.context syntax, I think it's just super useful to have the names of the models like that. Uh, and then one other tip I recommend is increasing the timeout on Olama, because um, you, you know, you're, you're trying to generate locally. And obviously the appeal is that you're saving a lot of money by doing it this way, but it is going to be slower. So I would recommend turning that up. Okay. So we're going to be retrieving from a uh, Weaviate instance that I've created that's loaded in the blog posts that have been published on Weaviate. And if you want to see how to load that into Weaviate, there's a notebook in the Weaviate recipes repository called uh, Weaviate hyphen import. Okay. So then we have dspy.settings.configure where we set the GPT Turbo as our default model unless otherwise specified, as well as this is our the Weaviate RM as our retrieval model, again, unless otherwise specified. 
with the with dspy.context context manager syntax. So once we've connected to our LLMs and our retrieval models, I recommend running a quick inference just to make sure everything is connected. So here we're asking what is artificial intelligence to the GPT Turbo API. And then we're also asking what is artificial intelligence to Mistral running on my laptop with Olama. So we see how we have slightly different answers from each of the models. And this is the idea, we have multiple models in our system. Okay, so next up I've created a new data set to be playing with retrieval augmented generation question answering with uh, DSPy. Although frankly, this, this experiment has completely changed my perspective on what it means to have question answering systems. I now no longer believe that you can just have a question without like question context. Like for example, if I ask you what are cross encoders, your answer depends on if I'm like a beginner and you know, if this is my first time learning about the concept or if say I already have you know, years of experience in, I don't know, information retrieval or something. Like, I, I believe that questions need more context, especially when it comes to evaluating them, but I am getting ahead of myself. Let's just, so basically this data set now consists of uh, slightly better questions and gold answers. So we're gonna be using gold answers uh, to, to evaluate our system. So we, we have 45 of these questions. We're gonna be using the first 30 for training, the next five for development, and then the last 10 for testing. So this contains questions like, how do you create a dummy endpoint in fast API that returns hello world when accessed? And so here's the answer of showing how to, how to do that. And then another answer, what optimizations does Weavia have to manage memory usage during parallel data imports? Again, so, so you already see how we have different kinds of uh, questions. Th this one returning like a code snippet of how to set up a fast API and this one returning more of like a conceptual thing of thread pooling optimization. So we have different categories of questions in our data set. All right, now let's take down a pretty big concept, the LLM metric. So there's actually a third layer to the LLM metric that I forgot that I had added in there and, and now seeing as I'm looking at the code, which is to summarize the context before assessing the uh, faithfulness is it grounded in the context rating. So let's start with the overview. We Again, so the way DSPy works is we can either have the shorthand syntax where we quickly describe modules like TS, DSPy chain of thought, and then say we have uh, like question, context, long answer, or we can write out the, the signatures in these uh, dspy.signature classes. So we have three classes here, three prompts, components. We start off with the evaluator. So the evaluator has a task description, evaluate the quality of a system's answer to a question according to a given criterion. Then we have the context for answering the question, the evaluation criterion, the question asked to the system, an expert written ground truth answer to the question, the system's answer to the question, and then a rating between one and five, and then we have some of this hand wavy structured output parsing stuff where we say important, only output the rating as an int and nothing else. So then we have the rating parser, which is a layer after the rating to make sure that it does indeed follow the output. So we just have a raw rating response that comes from this uh, component and then we just produce an integer value rating. So then we have the summarizer, summarize the information provided in the search, search results in five sentences. It takes in the question, it takes in the context, and then it outputs the summary. So now we put together our RAG metric program. So our metric program, again, it has the, uh, the evaluator, which is going to have the let's think step by step chain of thought. But then we don't need chain of thought to have the rating parser. I don't think it's necessary to think about what might be the, the flow in the value, right? So we just have dspy.predict, the racing rating parser, but then we also use chain of thought for the summarizer. So now in the forward pass, we take as input the gold and the prediction. We also can have a trace. I haven't personally learned about how traces interface in DSPy yet, but we parse the predicted answer from the pred value, and then we parse the question and the ground truth answer. And we have three criterion. So first of which is the assessed answer detailed? Is the assessed answer factually supported by the context? And then the ground truth answer to the question, question is given as ground truth answer. How aligned is the predicted answer? Okay, so the next thing to note is how we use the context manager to use different LLMs for different parts of the of the thing. So say we could re replace this with uh, our Mistral Olama or you know whichever model that you want to use. So in this case, we're just using GPT Turbo for both. But but hopefully this shows you how you could replace the LLMs however you want. Similarly with this where we have the self summarizer, you could also nest it like this and have Mistral Olama and then you could uh, indent it like this and then uh, use Mr. Olama for the context summary. So we take the context and we summarize the context and then we get the rating for detailed faithfulness and then uh, alignment with the ground truth. Uh, then we're gonna parse the structured rating from each of these raw responses. And then we combine these into a score where we're weighting uh, faithfulness twice as high as the alignment with the ground truth or the detailed rating. 
So then we're going to uh, wrap, we, then we wrap this program in the metric wrapper that we're going to be passing to our uh, compiler in a, in a second, where we give it the gold, the pred, the trace, and then we return this LLM metric, uh, which is this. We're going to uh, instantiate an instance of rag metric program with the LLM metric uh, here. So, sorry, should have put this down here at the bottom. Okay, so, so now we're gonna do a looks good to me test where we're just gonna be running one inference and seeing you know how well it works. So we have what do cross encoders do? We have this uh, toy ground truth answer. We, we convert this into a dspy.example object where we have the question is our looks good to me query and then our gold answer is a toy ground truth answer. Uh, so then we have a looks good to me prediction. They re-rank documents and we pass this into our LM metric to see, you know, to see how it works and we get the rating 3.4. 3.4, sorry. So we could inspect the reasoning if we wanted to by doing GPT uh, turbo to inspect history, n equals however many, if you wanna see the reasoning, the prompts that went into producing that rating. Okay, so next up we'll define it, be defining each of our four RAG programs. So first of all, we have vanilla RAG with retrieve then generate, and we have the generate answer prompt. So this is the same prompt that we had optimized in the previous video by using the Bayesian signature optimizer on this program of retrieve then generate. So, uh, so yeah, so everything's pretty standard from this, the context, the question, the answer. Uh, so one other thing that I want to note with this video is how you create multi-model systems with the with dspy.context syntax. So all of these RAG programs are going to be using Mistral 7B hosted with a llama on my laptop to be writing the answers. And the I think just, again, kind of with the theory thing, I just think this multi-model system design is like the sky's the limit with this because as you add layers to your program, so you have eight layers and... I think the best example is that parse the integer value from the rating thing where if you have some super specific task, there's no need to use GPT-4 for it. You can use one of these more efficient, smaller models that say run on your laptop during development. And I think that's just a super exciting story. And I think the breaking down of programs into uh, subtasks and the more granular you get with the subtask decomposition, the easier it's gonna be to plug in these cheaper, faster models. Okay, so with this notebook, we're gonna be defining these programs and then we're gonna be giving each one a quick looks good to me test, just running through it, what do cross encoders do, uh, getting our uncompiled answer and then rating it with the LM metric. So next up, we're gonna be adding depth by adding the summarizer to our retrieval augmented generation system. So now we have the retrieve, the summarizer, and then the generate answer. So next up, we're gonna be adding depth to our RAG programs by adding a summarizer before we uh, answer the question. So we have a new summarizer signature. Please summarize all relevant information in the context. You take as input the context and the question and you output the summarized context. So now we're initializing our components. We have self.retrieve, our retriever, and then we have the chain of thought and the summarizer. And now here's the next thing I really want uh, viewers to pay attention to. So when we're summarizing content, context, this could be like a massive prompt. <laughs> so if you're retrieving 10, uh, 10 contexts from your retrieval engine, and then you're going to try to summarize it into the context, and you're compiling few shot examples, you could quickly end up with just an absolutely massive prompt, because each of the, those examples are the summary of 10 search results. So one way to turn off optimization for certain parts of your DSPy program is to set the dot underscore compiled flag to true. So now DSPy is going to treat this signature like it's already been compiled and it's not going to optimize it during the bootstrap few shot uh, optimization. And again, the reason that we do this is because we don't want to have this massive uh, prompt that might result in say us needing one of these expensive long context models in order to do it. So in this case, we're just going to rely on the zero shot summarizer in this particular program. So then we similarly uh, just define our generate answer uh, component. And then in the forward pass, we define how they interact with the question. We retrieve the context from the question. And then we, uh, again, we can use this with this context manager to specify which LLM does which part of the system. So GBT Turbo is gonna be summarizing the search results. And then Mistral running on my laptop is gonna be answering the question. So again, we then give it an LLM uh, met it looks good to me test with the cross encoders question and then LM metric rating. So next up, we're gonna be testing out multi-hop RAG. So multi-hop uh, retrieval augmented generation, multi-hop refers to uh, breaking a question into sub-questions and you know, having the multiple hops through the, say, question answering graph. So the, the prompt now is write a search query that will help answer a complex question. We take as input the context and the question and we output a search query. 
So, uh, so similarly, we stitch together our program with the generate question, chain of thought, uh, generate search query. We have these hyperparameters of how many passages we want to retrieve for each of the searches. And then we have the maximum number of hops, the maximum number of loops in our loop for hop and range self.max uh, hops. Uh, so <laughs> discuss. Okay, so, so the difference between this and AutoGPT is AutoGPT has a prompt to say, uh, you know, should I finish looping or should I, you know, keep looping? So differently from AutoGPT, we're going to be fixing how many times we're going to be looping through and asking questions. So we first uh, take context by retrieving the context. We pass this in to generate a new question with the context in the original question. Then we're going to be appending our queries. And this is one other thing I wanted to kind of highlight is let's say you wanted to inspect these intermediate queries by, you know, using something like say Langsmith or, you know, Fe Arise Phoenix and th these kind of things. If you wrap all your outputs in a dspy.prediction object, you can jointly have the answer that you're trying to evaluate as well as all these intermediate computations. If say later on, we want to kind of inspect like what were the queries that uh, were produced in the multi-hop uh, looping. Okay. So, then again, we use the context manager to say that Mistral should answer the question in the end with all the context, and then we give it a quick looks good to me test. Okay, so next up, we're going to be adding summarization by just uh, using the signatures that we've already defined. We have our generate search query signature, we have our summarizer signature, and then we have our generate answer signature. And then we're going to be defining how they interact with the question. And we're going to be using these this query and summarize context log uh, to return to inspect this uh, to inspect the intermediate outputs when we're, you know, uh, later on testing out our program. So then we give it one more final looks good to me test. And now we're going to be start playing with the optimizers. So the first thing we're going to be doing is constructing a program wrapper class. So this is just going to have the name of a program, the uncompiled program. That's going to be initializing a program that we pass in. Then it's going to have an uncompiled score. We're going to then later on compile it and save it in self.compiled. And we have a self.compiled score. So now we're going to be looping through our four programs, program wrapper, rag, rag, rag with summarizer, multi-hop rag, multi-hop rag with summarizer. And then we'll give it another quick looks good to me test just to illustrate how we can uh, put our programs as key values into this dictionary and kind of organize, orchestrate this uh, experiment that we're about to do. Okay, so now we're going to be using our program wrapper to loop through the programs.keys and then we'll take each of the keys and then we'll run the uncompiled programs inference with our looks good to me query, which is what our cross encoders. And then we'll also get uh, an example of how the LM metric rates it. Okay, so now we're going to be using the evaluator. We're going to be passing in our development set, running it on four threads of the evaluation, and then we're going to be saving it in the uh, dot uncompiled score to each of the programs in the program wrapper. So we pass in our LM metric wrapper and we just loop through the programs. So next up, we're going to be compiling the programs with Bootstrap View Shot. So again, what Bootstrap View Shot is doing is it's tracing through and adding uh, this many numbers of input outputs to the prompt, and it's going to loop through this number of round to your training set or epochs if you prefer to think of it that way and then we have our metric and our metric could have a threshold or it could be a binary metric where uh, if the trace example doesn't pass the criterion then it's not added to the input output examples so in this case we're just using two bootstrap demos uh, we loop through again our program wrapper and then we have the uncompiled program we have teleprompter.compiled and we save the compiled program and then we add the compiled program to our program wrappers. So we bootstrap two full traces after three examples. This just, we haven't set that uh, metric threshold yet, but uh, say you have the metric threshold means the trace has to have an LLM rating of greater than say 4.5, then you can expect this to be say, you know, 20 examples <laughs> or however many it takes to find the traces that do pass that threshold. All right, cool. So now we check the looks good to me test with a compiled uh, program. And now we're going to be, and then we again just loop through all of it, get some outputs from each of the compiled programs. Now we similarly run the evaluator through the compiled and we save the dot compiled score. Okay, so hopefully this program wrapper is an interesting way to organize these experiments. I think this is going to be one of the biggest topics. Personally, I'm really looking forward to integrating weights and biases with uh, DSPy and learning more about uh, doing that experiment tracking with different hyperparameters around, say, the max number of bootstrap demos or di ablating different models that are composed in these multi-model systems, as well, of course, as well as, of course, these different uh, program designs. So finally, we're going to give a test to the uh, Bayesian signature optimizer. So the Bayesian signature optimizer is jointly going to be optimizing the task description for each of the components, as well as the few shot examples. So we pass in GBT4 that's going to be proposing paraphrasing to the task. 
we said n equals five, which is how many times it's gonna uh, uh, be running through the test. And then we compile it with the multi hop rag summarizer, the number of trials for Optuna. And I haven't personally dove deep into the uh, Bayesian signature optimizer yet, but after we run it, we can see the example of the prompts at the very end. Uh, so, so then we'll evaluate all the models and the held out test set and run some final looks good to me test. But with our Bayesian signature optimizer, you can see, for example, uh, with the summarized prompt that it rewrites the task description to, uh, to this as well as the input output examples. Awesome. So I hope you enjoyed this overview of adding depth to RAG programs. Hopefully the key focus of this, you understand this concept of what it means to add additional signatures, say have multi models that run inference through each of the components in the program and generally starting to understand this experimental framework of evaluating each of the different configurations for a program. For me, one of my biggest takeaways from this is thinking further about this LLM evaluation of question answer pairs. I think that we need more context to questions in order to uh, evaluate them accurately, especially when you have this multi-hop thing where it's gonna be going and getting context that isn't obvious from the initial retrieval. So I think we're gonna to need to think more about how we evaluate RAG. I know that this is a lot of where people's heads are at in the kind of RAG software space is the LLM evaluations and tracing, things like Langsmith or Arise Phoenix or Databricks inference tables. All these kind of things are super exciting and this notebook definitely helped me <laughs> appreciate it more personally and I hope it did the same for you as well. Okay, now let's take a look at another example of adding depth to DSPy programs, this time converting questions into entire blog posts authored by Erica Cardenas at Weaviate. And you can find this notebook, you can find all the notebooks in this uh, video series in Weaviate slash recipes slash integration slash DSPy. Okay, so the idea of this is to be converting questions like what is Reftivec and how can I use it to build e-commerce applications with Weaviate into entire blog posts. And so we do this with four layers of our DSPy program, the question to blog outline, the topic to paragraphs, and then the proofreader, and then the title generator. So maybe the most interesting thing is noticing how you have this structured output for the uh, blog outline where you force it to separate each topic with commas. So then you can split the list and then you can have a for loop and you see how you can have this control flow. Any kind of programming that you can do in Python, you can interface with your DSPy programs as shown here. So we loop through each of the top the topics in the blog outline, and then we'll pass this in as input to our topic to paragraph module as defined up here. And then we'll generate a full paragraph for that topic, which the proofreader then takes as input. And then we also get a title and then we have ourselves a blog post. So in this notebook, again, we used, we're using GPT-4 for this one. And this is how you would uh, instantiate the model. We have the signatures for question to blog. Your task is to write a blog post that will help answer the given question. Please use the context to evaluate the structure of the blog post. And we have a toy question. And then we have our topic to paragraph uh, prompt. Then we have the proofreader and the title generator. So then as shown above, we piece it all together into our blog post writer program. And then we're going to be testing it a couple times. And then we have our LLM metric program. So in this case, we haven't uh, gone too deep into this yet. Just rate a blog post on a scale of one to five on how well written it is. And then we run this through the blog post to get our rating. And then we're gonna be compiling it by using that rating and the bootstrap few shot. First, we evaluate the uncompiled with our toy data set of different questions about Weaviate things. And then we have our test set. So we evaluate our uncompiled blog post writer with the metric. And then we compile by adding one example of each of the tasks to the inputs. And then we evaluate the compiled blog post writer. So hopefully this is another useful example of what it means to add depth to our DSPy programs. In this case, having four different components of question to blog outline, topic to paragraph, proofreader and title generator. Thank you so much for watching this video on adding depth to DSPy programs. Hopefully you gained a better understanding of what this means from the concepts as well as these notebook examples. If you're looking for the code, it's uh, open source on Weavy8 recipes. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I'd love to see some uh, additions to the community tab if you have any resources that you want linked in here and uh, want us to, to take a look at so thank you so much for watching i hope you found this useful please subscribe as we'll be continuing this series and also please leave any comments on you know any issues you have with this video or any future topics that you want covered thanks again